the first time she called. I had no idea what to expect. No one else would take her calls anymore. They said she was crazy and would call 10 or 15 times a day if you made the mistake of answering. I felt bad for the bone lady as we would come to call her. She was a lonely old widow who lived in the middle of nowhere. She would call the library and ask questions, any questions she could think of, just to have someone to talk to. It was sad, but harmless. And so when, on my second week of working at the library, the phone rang and her number showed up on the display, I answered. She asked me about the fuse panel in an old model of a Ford truck. I looked it up online, read her the results, and even offered to print her out a schematic. She was perfectly nice, though she did tend to go off on tangents about the government and the dangers of cell phone signals. She declined the printout, thanked me for my help, and hung up. That was it. To be quite honest, I felt a little bit high on myself after that call. I had helped her out and talked to her when no one else was willing to. I was basically a saint. The next time she called, it was about 45 minutes later. She wanted to know how much omega-3 oil was in tinned fish. I looked it up, read out the list of omega-3 found in different types of tinned fish. At one point, she interrupted me to yell at her dog for whining, but thanked me again for my help before hanging up. She was eccentric, but polite. The next call was about antibiotics and whether or not they could alter your mood. I answered her query, then listened politely while she told me about a story about a friend of hers who had been killed in a farm accident after cheating on her husband for 40 years. It was divine retribution, she claimed. After about half an hour of listening to yet another story, this one about a news story she had seen on TV a few years ago, I had one of my co-workers page me over the intercom so that I could excuse myself and hang up. She called again a few hours later. She needed to know if garlic could cure gangrene. My patience was wearing thin, but I obliged her. In the background, I heard her dog, a rescue named Molly she had told me during one of her odd tangents, whimpering. There was a dull thud and a whimper, and the bone lady told me tough love was the only way to get a dog to obey. I quickly read her an article on garlic and homeopathic medicine, and one on gangrene, then made an excuse and hung up. Just before closing, she called again. She needed to know precisely what temperature human bones burn at. Just curious, she had said, out of breath. In the background, I heard Molly's anguished cries before I could even get to the computer. She called out Molly's name and swore loudly. Then she hung up. This was when we all began to refer to her as the Bone Lady. The next day, she called again and again. By the fifth time she called, I was beginning to tire of my Good Samaritan act. I didn't answer. She called again and again, finally giving up after about the seventh time. Over the next few days, the Bone Lady called relentlessly. I assumed she would tire of it eventually, so I stood my ground and didn't answer. One afternoon, we received a call from the police. She had called 911 to report that we weren't answering her calls and demanded that charges be laid if we didn't start answering. She claimed that because we were a public library, we worked for her and should be at her beck and call. Obviously, none of that is true, but she had called the police over and over. They were getting tired of her calls and told us we should just humour the old lady and answer her mundane questions. From that point on, answering the bone lady's calls became my job. We developed a routine where I'd talk to her for about 20 minutes, indulge her by looking up answers to her odd questions, can eating expired salad dressing kill you, and then have a co-worker page me so I had an excuse to hang up. 
After every call, we'd have a brief staff meeting to discuss the latest of her ramblings and laugh at how bizarre she was. It wasn't a nice thing to do, but it made it easier to put up with her constant barrage of calls. One day, she called to ask a series of questions about teeth. Next, she called to ask why the English language didn't gender words the way other languages did. Shortly after, she called back asking if anywhere in town sold shotgun ammo. Molly needed to be put down, she said. I asked why. She's gone feral. Must be rabies, came the hoarse reply. I heard whimpering in the background. I told her no one in town sold guns or ammunition. Never mind, she replied. I'll do it with the axe. I didn't hear from the bone lady for about a week after that. I thought maybe she'd finally gotten tired of our little game. But she hadn't. On Wednesday, she called to ask me to help her submit an ad to the local paper. She wanted someone to help on her farm. A girl, she said, preferably a teenager, because she could pay them less. She didn't trust men, especially young ones. They're too wild and unpredictable, she muttered. I gave her the number to the newspaper office and read her their prices for placing ads. She asked if I would be interested in the job. I politely declined and signalled someone to page me so I could hang up. Two days later, I saw her ad in the paper. I wondered if she actually needed help on her farm, or if she was just lonely. With Molly gone, she was all alone out there, miles and miles from anyone. A week or so later, I overheard a patron talking about how his daughter, Sophie, had been hired to help an old widow run her farm. It was a live-in job, and it paid well. He said the girl was nervous because she'd never been away from home before, but excited because the old woman seemed nice and was very devout. Her husband had been a preacher, and she still kept in touch with the church, he said. The last farmhand, a young girl named Molly, from down the road that he had worked on the farm for well over a year, had so endeared herself to the old woman that the woman had gotten her a spot on a mission trip to Ecuador with a church group and had even paid for her ticket. I continued shelving books, still somewhat listening to the man in the front desk gush about his daughter and her work ethic. She's barely been there a week, he said, and the woman's already grown quite fond of her, taking her on a retreat with her church group next week so she won't be able to phone for a while. I told her to take lots of pictures. The bone lady called again yesterday. She wanted to know if bunions can be removed by rubbing a raw potato on them. I heard a sound in the background, a soft sort of whimpering. She said it was her new dog, a rescue named Sophie she had taken in last week. She excused herself and put down the phone. There were several sharp smacking sounds, a loud cry, a drawn-out dragging sound, and then distant whines. She's still a bit jumpy, the bone lady explained, out of breath from dragging Sophie to her crate. It takes them a while to get used to the collar. <laughs>